Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton. Uh, this episode, episode 28, we're covering chapter 5 of part 1 low of book 2, Adulthood Rights of the Xenogenesis Trilogy by Octavia Butler. And I am joined uh, on my uh, enormous proto-ship that's disguised as part of the landscape by my co-host. Michael Glinka. Hi, everyone. <laughs> nice proto-ship, hidden... As a, uh, to be honest, well, we'll get to that, but like, I, <laughs> we already had a short conversation before the, uh, the episode. And, um, so I will look, we'll, I'll raise this idea before, but put a ship that's basically disguised like, as an environment you're around is pretty cool. I mean, like that you can't get mm-hmm. more camouflage than that. Can you not? Like, not some, like, invisibility technology or anything. You're literally like, oh, this palm tree is actually, a sh- you know, a, a, a ship. Part of the landscape, yep. <laughs> uh, actually, you've, you've, that's just um, reminded me, of, there's a there's a sequence in Stargate Atlantis where there's, like, a wraith ship that's just been sat there on the ground for, like, a couple hundred years or something, and it's got, they think it's a mountain because it's got, like, trees growing on it. <laughs> oh man, I need to rewatch. Kind of... I need to rewatch Stargate. Like, I, there's a lot of it. it there's yeah, a lot it's of like, it. <laughs> my father used to like, watch it all the time. I, uh, I, I got, I ripped him. <clears throat> I mean, I caught, bought him um, uh, all the all the seasons of Stargate uh, one and then Stargate Atlantis, and he would like watch it and then rewatch it, the whole thing. It's just crazy. Mm. Um, it's I, good sci-fi. It is really good, really good. Um, highly recommended uh, to watch, <laughs> but let's maybe go back to the book. <laughs> yeah, um, immediate and, tangent society. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I guess people learn new stuff if they have never heard some of the stuff. I hope they, they you know. But I guess who didn't hear about Stargate if they are reading about you know Xenogenesis? Like yeah. uh, by the by the time you should not hear about it, no. But like this is one of the primary functions of podcasts, as far as I'm concerned, right? You're hearing about stuff that people whom you're already interested in listening to discuss something, discuss other things in which they're interested, right? You get the cool new things to hear about by relay. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, so anyway. let's let's jump into your predictions for chapter five <laughs> before we get even more tangent. Yeah, three minutes in the recording is already off tangent. Um, so my chapter five prediction was um. Tino, Lilith, and Akin arrive at the village, and we you know we're introduced to the other villages. You know who the interesting people, and I thought maybe we will actually be introduced to some of our old friends from the ship. You know those people that Lilith awakened uh, and trained in the f- book one. So, uh, or other some other people as well. You know f- family members and stuff like that, or Lilith's family members and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. right, so well, you're, you're correct there. Yeah. Uh, so that was exciting to see if you know few uh, old people c- appearing, uh, but um, I'm still wondering what happened to Gabriel and Tate. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting one. I'm, I'm sounding mysterious here because uh, Do you know I, exactly, I, I, or I, you I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't remember whether or not we see them again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, mysterious, <laughs> Richard. It's either it's like Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's Richard. He either remembers or doesn't remember, but still sounds mysterious. Yep, right. that's the advantage I have here. <laughs> let's go. Uh, let's start the summary then, I guess. Um, yes. So the chapter starts with um, Lilith, Akin, and Tina arrive at the cusp of the village and start being followed by everyone curious, you know, seeing the new stranger arriving. So the, everybody starts following, basically. It's like. Basically, in the movies, when they're like a villager, you arrive and the stranger that has like hasn't village hasn't arrived, hasn't seen like a new soul for like you know century, and then suddenly like oh, there's somebody new, and mm. uh, they're all following him. Then and Lilith tells him that they will want to hear about his story, his village, his travels, anything that would be news to them. Um, and then when you know uh, when everyone has eaten and talked. They will all try to drag him to uh, into their beds, you know. But he has a choice, you know. He, if he's too tired and doesn't want to do it, so Tino is a bit surprised. Hmm. Yeah, she's she's pretty upfront about that. Yeah, I mean, like you know, <laughs> I guess 
because later on we're told how many men are in the village, so it sort of makes sense why, hmm. in a way. And also the fact that, that they all are bound on like as many making as many construct offspring as possible, so sort of hmm. makes sense, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but Tino is slightly surprised that um, he would have to entertain the village with his stories, but Liv says that he doesn't have to if he doesn't want to, you know, like it's all, uh, and that and as she's saying that one of the construct children approached him and like started like touching him and probing him with the a tentacle growing from its head. <laughs> like wow. Yeah. A little uh, disconcerting. Yeah, Akina warns the child on you know, Kali that he's uh, from a resistor val- village and he hasn't seen a construct before. Uh so they need to be careful, but you know, Tino didn't try to hurt them, so he seems mm-hmm. okay. But the kid is like, okay. Let's let's not touch him with my tentacle forehead. God, I'm so sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry. This is so bad. The calling this be awful. Uh-huh. I'd be awful. Mm-hmm. Like honestly, I can, and I sort of understand why construct people don't like the humans. Because holy shit, I can imagine myself coming up with awful nicknames. Anyway, <laughs> back from my awful character and back to book. Um, Lilith then turned to the crowd and announced after a brief conf- uh, conversation with Tino confirming that it's okay, Tino's name and that he'll talk to them and tell uh, you know a bit about himself to them. So if anyone wants to, anyone wants to join, go get yourself food and uh, and some drink and then come to my house, you know, to join them. And that people people were like, okay, Lilith, no matter what you do, don't start with others and just just run back home to get gather some refreshments and um, well, you know. Uh, while mm. uh, Lilith and Tino and Akin got, went back home. Yeah, so it definitely seems like Tino will be the, the center of attention for the village for yeah. the uh, foreseeable future, which is yeah. probably a little uncomfortable. <laughs> you just arrive in the second to see what's going on, and so next second is basically you're surrounded by people and wanting... Mobbed by weird alien-human hybrids. Basically. <laughs> nice. In the meantime, as that was, everybody was dispersing, trying to get some food to come back, Akin was taken uh, away from Lilith by Dichan, whom, via direct connection, the direct sort of telepathic uh, conversation, ta- um, Akin tells him about the you know about the new human, and um, Dichan noticed that Akin seems to like him. To which Akin responded, "Yes." He's a little afraid and dangerous. Mother had to take his weapon, but he's mostly curious. He's so curious, he feels like one of us. Um, that hmm. amused the Chan, but very soon the house like were full of people surrounding Tino with children at the front, which, as the book described, put Tino at ease. I mean, you know, usually if you want to calm someone down, you just put children around him, and like people usually don't see children as a threat, so... As mm-hmm. Tino was looking one by one at the children, Akin asked Dichan if he would try to steal one. To which Dichan answered as a joke that if he did, it'd probably be Akin. Um, as a joke in a way, but at the same time, Akin could sense a, no- a note of seriousness underneath that you know, um, mm. message. And the man probably meant no harm, was probably not a child thief, but Akin should be careful, should not allow himself to be alone with Tino. That's what Dichan directly tells to Akin. Hmm. So as everyone was finally getting there and getting comfortable, you know, starting feeding the children and the kids, you know, Lilith prepared food for her, for her own team, you know, some, uh, we're told, some flat cassava bread with hot skiggy and quad and alongside hot spicy beans, so basically like Mexican style food. Yeah, it sounds a bit like it, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Sounds nice. And also pa- pineapple good. and papaya for dessert. Really, mm. uh, actually, it's not a bad recipe to try out. Like you know, a bit of pork and, and hold on, the quat was a sort of alien fruit, a vegetable, wasn't it? Like, I think it was was quat kind of the cheesy like one. Oh, and maybe I, I can't remember what site C G Ski G. I, I think it was the one. C I G E E. It was the one that tasted like pork, basically. Okay, yeah. The fruit that tasted like pork had a flesh texture and. And flavor of a pork, so because pigs okay, don't so we've exist got, like, anymore. Cassava tortilla type things with pork and cheese and basically. nice spicy beans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically, mm. good old that Mexican. Good. Yeah, that's mm. you know that's when Tino started his story, and we're told he came from a village called Phoenix. Interestingly, the part two of the book is with the same name. So I, my future prediction is that we will be in the going to the village. 
Ah, damn story. tables of contents and the spoilerific content. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the first thing you see when you open the book, so I can't really yeah. not see it. But anyway, so that's a sure proof um, uh, prediction from me. Increasing the str- uh, the the uh, the percentage of my successful predictions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he said that the village existed already before even Tino's parents reached it, and when they arrived, uh, they were half dead. I mean, the Tino and his parents, because on the way they ate something raw that was poisonous, but was okay if you cooked it. Uh, they learned it after they reached the village. So mm. the village took care of them and brought them back to health. And they were really happy to see a young boy because potentially they thought that maybe sterility, sterility only affects adults and prepubescent children would still have a chance. And I'm like, what the mm. fuck? That's I, uh, yeah, because a little worrying. Because they were like desperate for a young girl. And I'm like, I get the desperation, but holy macaroni. A young girl, prepubescent girl, and a prepubescent boy suggesting to have sex when the girl is not ready even biologically, if the body hasn't developed to actually raise a child in her. This is a bit fucked up, mm. kiddos. Wow. M- maybe they're hoping that they will. Hmm, maybe they're hoping that will be able to mature and not be affected by it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it definitely seems like the the potential for some very sketchy things to be occurring there i honestly at this point when when i heard this it just sort of felt like a i don't know primitive tribal of type of thinking that like oh the aliens made us all infertile let's try previous and children it's like kiddo it's not medieval times anymore i mean technically it is for the for the humans there but i mean come on we all mm. know where it will all lead and it's not not cool but anyway i th- mm. I, I had this like ugh moment yeah, I think it, it sounds from the description that the, um, was it Nakanj also had an ugh moment? Oh yeah, that was the, um, Nakanj's response was, it, it drew its body tentacles up and began, like, the, the pre-strike threat gesture thing that it does. Uh, that was actually not, that was actually to response to a bit different, um, because uh, just in a second, because that was more of to, like, when Tino looked at Nikanj. In a way that it's like as if he recognized him. I think that was what Nikanj's response was to. Okay, I wasn't. I, I kind of read that as possibly being in response to, like the way that the humans were potentially treating the children. I wasn't sure, but yeah, yeah you could be right there. Um, but because what when he said that Nikanj responded that actually uh, because he was like, oh, because to have it, you know, if the children blah blah to have human children, right? And then he looked at Nikanj mm. and Nikanj goes, actually that's false. Like he goes, false mm. or true? And Nikanj responds, false. We told them that it's not possible, but the humans mm. seem to like decide to ignore that information. So at that point they were all like fine, right? Like the conversation, but um, yeah, okay. It was later when, like, Tino looks at Nikanj as if, like, he recognized it because, in fact, as we're learning later, mm-hmm. they've met before. Mm. And the, I think the other little tip that we get about the the nature of the community in Phoenix is they seem to be religious. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a church. Yeah. And the the parents, uh, Tino's parents, apparently spoke Spanish, so uh, I, I'd guess it was probably a Catholic flavored church. <laughs> yeah, potentially. Yes. Yes. Um, but it's interesting, like, when we learn more about the, the like, the, the people who were living there, I mean, they really picked up a lot of stuff, you know, like, building up the stuff, um, um, a lot of things that to provide, you know, technology for themselves, which is pretty interesting, but we'll hmm. get to that. So that's going back to what you noticed that like this is where the book was like Tino stared at Nikanj with a look that Akin didn't understand, but Nikanj's response was to draw its body tentacles up as if it was beginning a pre-strike threat gestures, uh, gesture. Humans called it knotting up or getting naughty, and it meant that Onkali was getting angry or generally upset. The Oloi could sting without killing, but the males and the females could only kill. And uh, Akin could kill with his tongue. So Nikanj told him the first thing to do was never release the st- stinger, uh, otherwise he could accidentally kill Lilith, you know, during nursing. Mm. Yeah, it puts a little new context on the previous chapter where he's nursing. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's, mm. like it's a little risky. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just imagine like this little like needle right in his tongue and when he's like sending the probe right like if he uses the wrong needle it's just mm-hmm. bye bye Lilith it was nice to meet you as a protagonist it's kind of a, it's like a, a lot of um a lot of responsibility that's immediately placed on like an infant child because they have <laughs> yeah. uh, effectively a mortal weapon right they can just kill someone <laughs> honestly it's like you know yeah it's actually pretty i mean you'd think like all those kids that run around with all those like different you know sensory arms and everything you know like they touch you and then suddenly you're like eh, and you're dead because they accidentally mm. release the stinger or something but i guess there mm. has to be some sp- specific mental stimulation of like to, to, to like prepare themselves to like like nikanj did but that sort of Nikanji's re- reaction to Tino sort of confused Akin, thinking like, why was he so upset? So he started observing uh, Nikanji instead of Tino. And then Nikanji like got closer to Lilith and Akin and took Akin from her. And then they shared the, all the genetic, inf- uh, so Akin shared all the genetic information he had on Akin to the time when he was sucking his finger, you know, when they first met. Hmm. And through the silent, vivid images and signals, they can't explain that he met Tino before, when he was just a child. Um, at the time, he told that you know he only spoke Spanish, and Spanish is one of the human languages they can't know. And he he was told that he wanted to stay, but they couldn't help him because of his parents. Um, he was eight year old, and Don Cali knew already then that the parents will try to escape. Um, um, and when Kali couldn't come up with consensus what to do with him, whether they should take the child away or not, because they weren't ready to like ra- they never they, they weren't ready to raise the child by himself. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> Paul Titus. Um, yeah. Anyway, they don't seem to be great at it. Anyway, Don Kali allowed them to go because they had the Prince of Tino and his parents. So if anything went wrong, they could always fashion genetic copies of them. Yeah, it's a little um. A little uh, dismissive in some ways, that, right? Yeah, yeah. Think, <laughs> It's okay. The die will make more of them. Yeah, we, we got a clone. We'll be fine. <laughs> uh, okay, fine. And uh, th- there's a little bit here where um, Nikanj says to, to Akin that uh, I handle his conditioning. Mm. Um, was, it's a little... It's not really specified, like, how long uh, Tina spent with the Oran Kali as a child i think it's that he left when he was eight but we don't know how long he was awake for uh-huh. while his parents had a little training and so on and it, it's a little interesting that they he they use the word conditioning because the oncali previously seemed somewhat averse to the idea of like social conditioning or, or using just culture as a means of like keeping <sighs> the uh the humans on board but i feel like i'm a bit confused with the timeline here right again um, we had this conversation about the timelines, but like, because it must have, I don't know, did it ha- happen like when he was eight years old? So that means that he met him before um, Lilith. I mean, that's what you suggested, right? But like, it feels to me this whole idea of them conditioning, this this whole idea of them like not knowing what to do. And then the Paul Titus situation and then Lilith, right? I think that's that's... That's how the timeline went because they didn't know what to do, so they just left them alone. Then they had Paul Titus, who was a kid, and then grew up as an adult between them, and then like that didn't work well when Lilith appeared. Hmm. And it just feels to me that this whole like conditioning, like first of all they were like against it, they didn't know what to do. Then they had literally a kid, uh, basically you know, be with them um, for I don't know how long, and becoming an adult and never having interaction, and then that the consequences of what we were seen in book one and then mm. you know then you have Lilith at the end of book one saying oh you know why don't you just take the children from the humans and con- you know teach them like t- to love you with, mm. you know blah blah to so condition them and they say oh this is not biological enough for them for us so it's like mm-hmm. the progression is weird like do you know what I mean like that yeah so they seem a little unsure of exactly how to get the best results right there seem to have tried a few different things but yeah it's it's interesting and of course the timeline is always a little bit um tricky to figure out because they have all those humans on ice in fact well not literally but well, you know, yeah, in suspended yeah. animation right so they can just pluck people out of cold storage at any time at whatever age they were when they went back in pop a and, cold uh, one basically and uh yeah if they need one 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a bit weird. I, I've, I've, this, these timings sometimes are, get really confusing because uh, when you actually, when we analyze the book right properly and sit down, timings get weird. Like you can read the book, it's like, oh, okay, okay, he was a kid, that's whatever, and you just skim over through it. But when you actually point it out and think about it, it's like they tried a lot of things and they never worked exactly what they wanted. And then they're like, now they're really forcing the biological part of the conditioning instead of like the uh, cultural right uh as that seems to be the approach yeah and I mean, that seems like the best fit for their general attitude towards the stuff anyway right to be honest yes but at the same time it doesn't mean it's the best overall but hey don't know hmm. it's it seems to be like a bit confusing in some ways we still don't really know much about their internal politics and their decision-making process either, right? We don't really yeah, know. Yeah, we exactly. Is, is there factionalism within the Onkali? I mean, it's, he says here that like the Onkali couldn't come up with a consensus, so that means there was definitely mm. some sort of like, let's say, meeting in a way between them and discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Question is, how many of the Onkali were actually involved in the discussion, whereas it was just like the. Uh, I don't remember the faction's name, the ones that, for example, maybe they were landing on Earth that were, like, you know, um, just involved. Or was oh, it the, the, um, the three kind of groups. Yes, the, the it says, and, and so on, yeah. So, like, mm. is it just between those groups or is it between all of them? We don't know. So, is it just the mm. Uloi because males and females don't really have speak anything to anyway because the Uloi uh, is responsible for most of the stuff? I don't know. It's, it's hard to tell at this point. Mm-hmm. But this is where, like, um, why explains why Nikanj sort of felt a bit threatened because Nikanj thought also that Tino recognized him, but probably cannot recall it, and I can ask for clarification. To which Nikanj explains him to that, as the book describes it, most humans lose mm -hmm. access to old memories as they acquire new ones. They know how to speak, for instance, but they don't recall learning to speak. They keep what experience has taught them usually, but lose the experience itself. We can retrieve it for them, enable them to recall everything, but for many of them, that would only create confusion. They would remember so much that their memories would distract them from the present. Uh, and then they can't send him, uh, send Akin a image of a human dazed, you know, because of overflow of memories. And Akin then asks him if he will ever get that way, but he can't say that never. The construction were careful, ma carefully made not to be like that. And Akin notices that Lilith is just a human. And Nikan says that it's not her natural ability. And also she was chosen carefully as well. Hmm. There's a little bit of a contradiction there in that what the ability that Lilith gained was like a perfect memory after the time point where yes. she gained that memory. Yes, right? She yes, didn't yes. get like total clarity on her past memories. But it sounds here like that's what Nikan is saying they could do which is yeah which is not really the case like we don't actually retain as far as we can tell like uh you know a i mean they get, of, of, they get overwritten right so it's not really yeah. possible to bring back for example memories of when for example you were learning how to walk when you were a kid or something like that this is mm -hmm. like i mean that is that memory is long gone. Like it's it's not possible. It's being overwritten by more urgent, important things for to your life than than that. Hmm. And it, it does point out the distinction between like autobiographical memory and um um know, I've lost the word for the other form of memory, like the um skill type memory. Like you know, if you learn to play the piano, you don't necessarily you know, like you retain the skill even if the you don't retain muscle memory. Sort of. Yeah, there's, there's another word for it. It's. Uh, It'll come back to me at some point, sure. but yeah, that the other type of memory that's not autobiographical memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we do have that that kind of pattern of retaining the skills that we learn. Yeah, like, you know, it's like training a neural network, and then you have the network, but you don't have the data that you use to train it. It's the same kind of uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. principle, right? That's the what those are based on, and analogous to the way we learn. I mean, you know, it's. It's important that we lose some of those memories because I would not want to remember how I've learned to poop properly in a toilet instead of, you know, <laughs> a diaper. That would be awful memory to learn, to remember to remember. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just this was the first thing that came to my mind when you noticed that and I was just like, Oh my god, my brain, what are you doing? Honestly. Anyway. It is kind of interesting that that, that this possibility of retrieving past 
memories is mentioned here because like in the kind of late 80s and then early 90s there was a whole there was this uh in the u.s there was this kind of like spate of um this kind of recovered memories fad or like repressed memories thing there was this notion that you could uh recover memories from from your past uh in in like repressed memory therapy or whatever they called it it was never sort of properly recognized because it, but, it turned out to not be i mean particularly isn't, scientific yeah i mean isn't that like i mean nowadays it's obvious because like if you are um let's say for example taken to a police station and there's like investigation going like if people suggest you something you like literally recall your memory but you can sort of recall in inverted commas um the memory in reality but in rea reality it's not what you really saw it's just because you were given certain word clues or stuff like that basically um indicates that you basically modify your memory on the go as you sort of remember it again in the inverted commas hmm. and there, i mean there, there was um like Elizabeth Loftus and her group um, did quite a lot of work on that kind of stuff with um, like false memories, uh, where they could basically you know implant a memory of one sort or another that was um, the one that kind of got the catch line of like the lost in the mall memory, where they basically mm -hmm. managed to convince people that they had a memory of having been like lost by their family in a shopping mall, when this incident had never actually occurred to them in okay. in their childhood. Uh, but yeah, so the, the and there was this whole conflict, the, the memory wars of the 1990s between um, like some of the scientists who were studying how memory worked and some of these like repressed memory people, mm -hmm. because there was this whole, um, there were a, a whole host of um, accusations and even a couple of criminal convictions for people who had uh, supposedly recovered memory of like childhood um, abuse or assault. And in one case, like the murder of a friend, someone was convicted for the murder of a of a like i think it was a nine-year-old child um like 21 years after the fact based on like one person's supposedly recovered memory and it was eventually overturned when they kind of i forget exactly why but i think there was some some material evidence to, to counter this uh, proposal but yeah there was a whole um see this is a uh, set of court battles around it. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of proves. I mean, history has shown so many times that like the memories can be really, um, like you, you can't trust them; they're fallible. So mm. the the fallacy of remember, like of trusting the memories, and especially twenty years later, like mm -hmm. I mean, come on, like this is especially with the fact that we know nowadays that it's so easy to suggest people that they remember something else than the reality where you know, the, the reality was different it's just mind-boggling i forget who did the work but um there was a famous experiment on eyewitness testimony mm -hmm. where um i think they basically had like a lecture theater full of undergraduate students and then they had um like someone come in with a fake gun and shoot someone just like out of the blue yeah um and at the front of the classroom, I can't remember exactly what they, you know, they staged this whole scenario and then they interviewed everyone in the room about what had happened, you know, to get details of exactly what the order of events was, like what, what, what was the gun like, what was the person like. And like the, when you looked at all of the different accounts, none of it made any sense, right? They got like completely different descriptions of the order of events, of the gun, of the person who shot it. It was like everything was just completely different. Like everyone was giving a, like a, 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 a completely divergent mm -hmm. accounts of what had happened and they were all there and witnessed it the same thing uh so it, it gives you a kind of a, a, a nicely concrete sense of of how um unreliable eyewitness testimony especially can be. undergraduate students <laughs> <laughs> don't trust undergraduate students basically that's the conclusion we come up with <laughs> <laughs> i mean like half of them were hangover anyway uh, let's not be too down on the poor undergrads. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, basically, all research is done on uh, for like social psychology stuff is done on like undergrads, <laughs> right? Because they're just there. Uh, it's uh, been identified as a bit of a problem yeah. because like it, it's not always generalizable because like it's just like highly educated grad uh, like uh, students uh, uh, in from a relatively narrow demographic are like the subject of the majority of all psychology experiments. <laughs> doesn't help the generalizability yeah so um going back to the chapter i guess um 
Akin sort of then changes the topic and asks about Tino, you know, how did Tino find Nikanj again? And did he see this village before? And Nikanj, though, says that this village didn't exist before he. Nikanj explains to him that there are a number of villages alongside the river. And the fact that Tino is here is probably not a coincidence. He was lucky enough to meet the harmless Lilith who introduced him to the village. Um, Akin thought that Lilith is not harmless. <laughs> and Nikanj agrees, but it's convenient for her to seem uh, harmless. Like, yeah, it's it's nice to feel like, you know, Lilith probably could break a man in half just, just you know, like with her bare hands if she wanted to, with the super strength. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, also um, sharp as a razor, that one. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, but it, yeah, I did kind of enjoy the fact that, like, the Akeen, who's, what, like, about a year old at most, nine months, something like that, and, has already noticed yeah. that his mother is um, not harmless. Yeah, this is like when Lilith says, I can go clean your room, you do clean the room because that slipper can do serious <laughs> damage. <laughs> uh-huh. um, Nikan then tells Akin that Tino probably avoided all the resistant villages because they could be dangerous you know, the infighting and stuff like that. The conversation ends mm. with Nikanj asking if Akino likes Tino and Akino likes Tino, to which he says yes. Good. Your mother doesn't yet, but she might have changed her mind. Perhaps he'll want to stay. Um, I think at this point, because I mean, like, uh, later on, there's this weird reaction that Nikanj has, but like, I think this mm. is Nikanj actually likes Tino. Maybe the be- pre- the previous interaction, but I think Nikanj wants uh, Tino to stay in the house. Yeah, yeah. I get that impression. But the focus goes back to Tino, who is continuing the story of his village. Um, he tells them that it was like the village, like this village, the one they're now, but without children. They were hard to bring back the civilization. They were salvaging, querying the mountains. Tino was never allowed to go in fear of him getting hurt. They build real houses with bricks and glass windows, which is pretty amazing. Hmm. They made the glass and traded with other resistor villages. Some people, when they saw how well it was going for them, decided to join. Makes sense, you know, like if the village is prospering, why not join? Hmm. Yeah. It doubled their numbers overnight, uh, as he described. The village transformed into a town. They built mills for power. Everything was going well until one week, two men and one woman hung, this- hung themselves. And... Four other disappeared, and Tino says it was like a disease. Mm. Every week, someone would disappear or something would happen to them. Um, he then asked, where did those people disappear? To the villages like the one he's now without any technology? Why do people continue living like this? You know, when Ayer, Akin's older mm. sister, answered that they live comfortably, um, Tino refused that they, vi- they, they live like savages. Why didn't they build real houses and get rid of these shacks? Lived and asked, how many of those real houses of yours were empty when you left Tino? Which is pretty good comeback, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. And she already destroyed him enough in the previous chapter. I don't think she needs to keep <laughs> kicking him. Like, come on. Yeah. Lilith, give the man some break. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty tough story as well. Right? I mean, it's, it, they, seem, they made some good progress right, on bootstrapping some I mean, you know, some technology. glass, bricks, or cement, and yep. then also the fact that, you know, they built mills for energy, mm-hmm. so I mm-hmm. guess some sort of, like, electrical energy at some point, maybe? Maybe too early? Or just mechanical energy, just grinding stuff, I guess, for, like, seeds for flowers, stuff like that, I guess. So if you've ever seen the, um, like, hydroelectrically driven... Um, well, not hydroelectric, hydropower, just uh, mechanically hydropower driven like uh, woodworking shops. Um, I can't remember what kind of era exactly they were about, but the, they're pretty amazing, right? It's just a whole bunch of like saws and mills and equipment that's all like a, a you know, full sort of modern suite of woodworking tools like lathes and stuff, but all driven by like a belt system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, so you know, you've got a, a hydroelectric, a hydro, I keep saying hydroelectric, like, you know, a hydro thing that's yes. just spinning and then you, you know, attach a, a, a belt to it and it goes through a whole bunch of, you know, cogs and um, I mean, uh, belts and stuff and 
gives you power. I mean, even the basics are those type of stuff. Like, for example, I saw in Japan um, a mill um, in a, a river that was basically collecting the mm. water from the river and transferring it to the lot to the field nearby to water up the um, the field for um, the, the rice, basically. You know, so, mm-hmm. so even simpler stuff like this is already amazing to be able to, you know build the mill and it's functioning and it, it's efficient enough to like mm-hmm. um, produce enough energy to cut down the time for, you know, take off some stuff in the work, manual work of your hands, right? So. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the simple thing is just a, a water-driven hammer, right? Yeah. You have a, a water drop and a bucket on the end of one um, thing and a, a, a fulcrum and a hammer at the other yeah. end and it, you know, it, it fills and drops and just, you know, you've got like a nodding donkey type setup, yeah, you know, just yeah. it fills the bucket and hits the hammer. So you can, you can use that to, to, you know, to do quite a lot with, to grind grains and stuff. Even two stones grinding against each other is enough to like, for example, um, for, you know, making flour and stuff like that. So that's, mm. I mean, a lot of uses are there and it's, it's already good enough. I mean, for those people who are interested in more like, you should read Dr. Stone manga, it it really is pretty good because it goes into like basics of like uh, developing energy and electricity really quickly from those basic. Cool. Yeah, it's 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 like it's very it's a manga in itself, but like also it teaches you how to actually you could start from like if you wanted and you had the components on hand, set of materials, you could do it like yourself as well, which is pretty interesting. But yeah, it's I mean it's. I'm amazed how well they're doing. And I guess it only take, took them, I said, like, probably didn't take that long them to develop all this technology, I guess, if mm-hmm. they hadn't, you know, this number of people and and also prolonged lives as well, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But uh, if, if they want to sort of, you know, bootstrap all the way up to being able to actually do something about their fertility problem, then it's going to take them oh, a while, yeah, right? Yeah. They've got to get, you know, genetics, some biochemistry, and, and you'd have like to, the ability to do IVF. You'd have to develop uh, microscopy, the first thing, then the mm. engines to have electricity and stuff like that. Then you'd have to actually develop, you know, proper chemical plants and access to certain chemicals to have development of, like, you know, even basic components for the for like uh and yeah it's a long journey ahead of them the main barrier in many ways is material science stuff yes right? it's the it's it's all very well having the kind of idea you know i could make you can make the microscope with you know this but you need the the glass of a certain quality and you need the steel of a certain quality yes. before you can get there so like it's... it has to be two percent carbon steel to be hit to be st- uh, stainless steel and all because if it's higher it's blah 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 and it's like oh if you add cobalt to it and all of this like knowledge actually we don't actually realize that how important and plastics as well development of plastics yep, yep. um mm-hmm. i mean you know you can have sulfur and you can melt it heat it up until like several times you'll get the plastic sulfur which would become a, it's the first plastic sort of i think discovered but the actually useful plastic uh mm. it's still a bit of a journey ahead of them yep yep that's a it's a long way to to climb and there's there's a lot of knowledge that you need to to get to some of the stuff that you need to actually be able to to figure I out just, what it is that the oncology did to your fertility yeah. and how you might go about reversing I it. I just realized that if there's any apocalypse we really need to protect the material scientists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's that's always the the thing, right? It's the having the the ability to go from from dirt to something useful. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, first of all, finding uh, areas uh, in the like geographical mm-hmm. areas that have like iron, copper, and stuff like that. All of these raw materials and like just processing them is already a pain. I can imagine like taking forever mm-hmm. before they can even reach anything. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, it's all well and good to say you can make the stuff if you can like order the stuff you need to make it off the materials yes. list. <laughs> yeah, so you can it's just the... like you know, uh, mm-hmm. on Kalizon, like like Amazon on Kalizon. Hi, can I have this, this, and this? <laughs> and just like it arrives in your like this organic dropship. It's, it's just like it wasn't it like an um, oh it was in the Rick and Morty when like they delivered Jerry in this like box organic <laughs> box to the <laughs> wedding. <laughs> basically that yeah yep i I see that yep (laughs) oh dear (laughs) yep uh that was very strange nice and lubricated items arrived okay anyway um (laughs) but yeah so the it it seems like the um the inhabitants of this village kind of had a good like hit their ceiling yeah on 
their ability to make progress towards this this goal and i mean like there's only so far you could probably get with that like, even if you're going to live for a long time like you you don't have the 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 skills yeah. necessary right the number of the people uh, and it takes to do that right it's the um a bit like the handicap of, of speed super intelligence yeah. right speed super intelligence it just is the the ability to run your brain but like way faster than normally right it's, it's kind of analogous to having an extended life mm-hmm. right you have longer time in which to do the thing it's just you, you don't you make the time saving if you're just living longer but right that, that doesn't mean you can do stuff that's outside of your like upper mm-hmm. limit right it just means you can get more done quickly yeah. right give me an infinite amount of time and i probably still wouldn't be able to like you know uh, solve fermat's last theorem or like rederive some of the underlying maths of quantum theory and relativity yeah right? that's, but that's, it's just the fact that like i feel like this village they all threw the, all of them threw themselves into work to sort of forget like their circumstances they were at and that was all good and fine for a while, but you know that lingering thought at the back of your mind that's like this is all for nothing is always mm. there. Like I can just you know imagine that being the case for them. That's why they started dropping off like basically you know birds and you know, just like gone, mm-hmm. gone, gone. You know like yeah, the the, the capability to to fix the the problem that they have was going to remain outside their reach and they kind of they saw it uh which i mean yeah. i mean like with prolonged life i guess maybe they would be able to maybe eventually reach certain i don't know technological advancement but by the time they do hmm. i feel like there wouldn't be enough of them to actually reach where they needed to be to actually try to maybe addressing the question of the lack of of the fertility Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Without uh, a next generation to pass on the project to. Yeah. Though. Yeah. That, that's that's the thing. Like you know, and anyway, and they could. I mean, if they try to steal children, that wouldn't work anyway. So. Hmm. Yeah. That kind of uh, defeats the object. So, after the question, uh, you know, how many of those houses were you uh, of yours were empty when you left? You know made Tino angry like the resistor he said he the resistors never had a chance they didn't make the war they didn't make the Onkali they didn't make themselves sterile but they tried their best to make a town he believed that if they managed to build a town the traders must have cities by now but they are living in small villages like cavemen and a person from book one is back the first person Leah I think she is yeah. always Leah from the book one I hope she I hope it is because they're later on I think so um Ray is also mentioned so I think it's Leah yeah, yeah. She tells him that the kids will be fine, but she wishes there were more people here instead of building useless houses and killing one another. I just then says that it's maybe time they offer the resist the way back to them, which caused some of approval in the room. But Tino tells them mm. to leave them alone. He wouldn't tell them where the village is anyway. And that's when Nikanj goes, moves in and like face to face to Tino and goes, uh, so no one could get between them and tells him that we know exactly where your villages are, kiddo. Like, you can. You don't have mm. to tell us. They ju- they wouldn't just focus on Phoenix. It was time to approach all of the resistor villages and ask them to join them. They just wanted to remind them that they don't have to live sterile lives. They but they won't force them. The Onkali let them go because they didn't want to hold anyone prisoner and anyone was free to leave any time they want. Tino, sort of uncomfortable, turns around to face Liv and asks how many men are there in the village. She, on the other hand, looks around for find Ray Ordway another friend book from book one, whose responsibility mm-hmm. was to keep a small guest house stocked with food and other supplies. This was where the newly arrived men would live until they're paired off. It was the only house built with cut trees and palm thatch, which is interesting information. Hmm. Ray kept guest house because he had chosen not to wander. He had paired with Leah and apparently never tired of her. The two of them with their three Onkali mates had nine human-born daughters and 11 Onkali-born children. Wow. Hmm. Busy. All <laughs> bored. Yep. All bored. And they have nothing else to do. I leave it to the you know, hmm. assumptions of the reader. I mean, I assume the, um, the Onkali will be uh, trying to produce lots of human hybrid children to you know accelerate their breeding program experiments, right? They, they'll want plenty yeah. of... Uh, 
I try to, to I try to with. stick with the the them being bored and just you know like, what else is there to do, <laughs> you know? Hmm. But your point is probably the more realistic one. I mean, I assume that they can, uh, but you know, the the Uloi clearly have the ability to to do the um uh to act as contraceptives if they want to, right? So I guess uh, so. I assume <laughs> I assume they actually want the kids. I guess so. Yeah, I'm, I mean, like nine. I mean, 20 kids in total. Wow, that's just, just like, oh, mm. just thinking about a headache. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, childcare must be a bit of a pain. <laughs> I mean, there's five adults there, right? So it's four children per mm. adult, but still. I suppose, actually, if the children are as um, immediately uh, self-sufficient as I um, mean, yes, Akin, that's the then, other's um, perspective. Like, if there are all, like, Akin, mm. then I guess, I mean, they're basically adults in baby forms, but so you only have mm. to take care of them for like the first year, year and a half, when they start, and then when they start walking, you can like, okay, chill, go build yourself a house, basically. Yep. Um, or go ask the ship to grow you one. <laughs> basically, <laughs> um, Lilith asks Ray how many men are there in the guest house at the moment, but and we are told that there are five men in total, but none of them in the guest house in the. I mean, five men total in the village, but none of them in the guest mm. house. Though Tino can have it all for himself. Um, he shakes his head when he hears that, saying, "No wonder they didn't build anything. You know, they had no men." It's like Ray tells him then they're like they're building themselves a new way of life, and he should shut his mouth because he's no he knows nothing about them. Jon Snow. Hmm. Tino refused what that what is there to us, except for their garden where it looks like a garden, they have nothing. Um Lilith responds to that, saying that Onkadi are changing them and, and uh, changing us humans and the humans are changing them. The whole next generation is made up of genetically engineered people. It is not secrets, but once the ship leaves, the Onkali will be stuck with them. Everyone here is mixed one way or another. It was a choice and better choice than being a slave or prisoner. Anyway. The humans learned to live in the forest, but Don Kali told them that they didn't actually have to because, surprise, surprise, they would live comf- in comfortable houses as the ones on the ship. They wouldn't want to go back to that anyway because book one, reminder, they had to live in the thatched houses. Mm. But the house that has a thatched roof to which Tino goes like, but this house has a thatched roof. And it goes like, mm. well, you assume that because the leaves are green, but that's because they're alive. They didn't build the houses, they grew them. They can't provide mm. the seed. They just cleared the land for the space and trained the walls and made them aware of us. This is what the book says. Tina frowned. What do you mean, aware of you? I thought you were telling me it was a plant. It's an Kali construct. It's actually a kind of larval version of the ship. A neotenic larva. It can reproduce without growing up. It can also get bigger without maturing sexually. This one will have to do that for a while. We don't need more than one. Hmm. So it's cool, it's right? really cool. It's basically a non-Kali version of a Zerg. Like you, pl- it just lands in land. You have like this, I don't know, hive or overmind, and it just grows, and everything else just grows out of it. Hmm. Now I, I'm not overly familiar with the Zerg because I've only played StarCraft like twice in a LAN party at the physics department at my sixth form. Oh my college. god, that's. <laughs> but, uh... I mean, that's the best time to play StarCraft. I mean, that that was the best times to do that. But man, you should play. It's like the storyline is mwah, chef's kiss. Uh, and the game is great to be honest like the first one and the second one as well uh, but in basically in a way it's interesting because the, the Onkali ship larvae so it's basically that's how they're building their ship um, mm-hmm. and we're told that eventually a group of Onkali and the construct children will just go traveling once they like uh, the ships are ready to the ship is ready to you know to grow and fly away yeah, I mean, so it's a really uh, kind of uh, interesting concept, right? Because the, the ship seems to just provide like a an environment for the Oankali to live more or less wherever yeah. they are, right? Even in, in space, when they're being an interstellar vessel, the ship's just there to be a system that they can live in. And it does the same thing on the surface of yeah. Earth. It just sort of like, like grows itself into the ground and you get this whole... It seems like uh, I think they they mentioned at some point that like a piece of the riverbed nearby is actually kind of part of the ship. Yes. Yeah, so or the, this this like larval ship. Yeah. So the book describes it here. There's only one in this village, and a lot of that is underground. What you see it appears to be houses, grasses, shrubs, nearby trees, and to some extent riverbank. It allows some erosion, traps some newly arrived silt. It its inclination though it's to become a closed system, a ship. We can't let it do it 
that here though. We still have a lot of growing to do ourselves. So yeah, it's sort of it like it completely is like mm. the whole almost like the land around them is basically a part of a ship that's mostly like an underground um uh Sarlacc pit. There we go from Star Wars basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, or like a, a fungal mycelium or something just like permeating the ground around them. I don't know. It's, it's a little unclear like how much of the area around them is like all ship and how much of it is material from, from the forest. Yeah. They seem to be at least partially contiguous. It's uh, but really interesting. That also brings me to the conversation we had before the episode that we mentioned at the start of the episode that like I'm just wondering mm. about the whole idea of them like the ship growing using the biomass of the planet right like what will happen once the mm. like the little ship like seedlings let's say because let's say there's one per village right mm -hmm. once they combine right are they gonna be the size of the planet are they just gonna absorb most of the biomass and just go bye bye or is it just like some of the biomass mm -hmm. is like taken from the sun because of the green leaves and everything photosynthesis i guess but what's gonna happen next yes yeah, so i was thinking it doesn't really it doesn't really seem terribly in character for the Owen Carly to just like resource strip a planet. Um, but maybe that is actually because I was thinking about it in in terms of just energy mm -hmm. initially. Because, you know, as long as the, the star's still outputting enough energy to, to work on, they can maintain a reasonable uh, you know ecosystem on mm -hmm. the planet. But there's other limiting factors, right? You've got your rare earth metals and stuff that you need for for catalytic processes in biology and so on that are going to be finite, right? So the if if you take a big bunch of resources off the surface of the planet and fly them out in interstellar, interstellar spacecraft, then eventually you're going to run out of some of the raw material that you need planet side to, to maintain an, yeah. an ecosystem, even if the star's still going. So maybe they do eventually just kind of strip all of the useful minerals out of the the planet and turn them into uh into ships but then again there's gonna be someone kali that's left behind on the planet as we know so they can't take all of it there has to be something for the other on mm. to survive and they're like their offspring so for me it's a bit um especially like for example nikanj and we know nikanj's family and Lilith is gonna stay on the planet that's that's the given mm. so i i it feels to me that um like Obviously, there has to be some crazy recycling taking place on th on the ship using mm. I don't know whatever energy storages they have to ensure that you know that the whatever rare mate metals are that they're using are utilized. Um, they're continuously in, the, in continuous cycle in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. like, yeah, it feels strange a bit the fact that you know they're growing a ship and then this thing like basically is gonna strip away most of the biomass who knows what like what they actually require um for the survival probably and definitely most of the carbon thing you know based um or uh chemicals and stuff like that so it, it for me it just feels like okay this is turning a bit weird in a way that like oh we're here to trade and at the same time i'm gonna strip up your my your planet of any living things it's like okay cool i mean it'll take a while I mean, it will take a while, obviously, <laughs> the, considering the lata lifespan of the Onkali and the how, like, the, probably for mm. them, you know, building a ship probably takes several centuries or millennia before it's ready to fly again. Like, mm -hmm. and I mean, we're kind of doing the same thing, just like slower and less intentionally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but that's it's gonna hit us sooner or later if we don't uh, realize that. I mean, we'll eventually run out of, you know. Um, important minerals and stuff to do stuff with um in term in in the sense that like once we've used all the ones that are available to us we'll have to you know once they're all being used in systems for doing something we'll have to get some more but you know, we can always just you know go out and grab some asteroids and i mean that's one solution or the other one is like recycling but i guess like how some compounds like whether you can actually you know let's say if you oxidize some compounds can you reverse them to like pure metals or something let's say if we're talking about pure metals yeah, but I mean, like, if if you're using, say, literally all of the neodymium on the planet in magnets for mm -hmm. something, then you need more of it in order to expand whatever it is that you're doing, or you have to come up with a technology that uses less of it to achieve the same thing. I guess so. Right? It's the there will eventually be some kind of limit point on some of those things. So it's yeah, well, but you know, we'll go out and harvest more stuff. Yeah, but I like your comment here on the notes. If you want to uh, about Tino. 
Oh yes, yeah. So I mean, the we we heard about this this you know proto ship growing in the ground, but like he, it's a, Tino's coming in and telling a bunch of people who are living on like a possibly sentient organism that's capable of growing into a self replicating interstellar spacecraft and telling them that their tech sucks because they don't have glass windows. It's like uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're a little out of your depth here. <laughs> Honestly, it's just such, it's such a good comment. Like, I mean, honestly, if if somebody said it to him, I feel like, uh, I mean, Tino's already dead after the whole rela- you know conversation with Lilith, but now it's just basically kicking dead body into like a ditch at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's um, <laughs> he's got a lot to learn about the uh, the degree of asymmetry that exists between the the Oankali and the resistor humans, right? The they kind of um they have the impression and they've kind of given their kids the impression that they're uh, they have some hope mm. <laughs> as a campaign to be uh you know separate humans but uh the way they want to do it is is not going to work out cuz the Owen Carly just their uh their leads kind of insurmountable so i just i guess let's finish off the chapter um mm-hmm. So Tino still didn't believe all that what they're telling. So Nikanj tells him to to look up, and he sees a little soft glowing light from the ceiling. And like the light wasn't there when they came in because there was no need for it. But since it started getting darker, it has activated, and everything around him was alive. You know, Nikanj tells him that the floor wouldn't be comfortable if it was a dead wood. Everything around them is just made to be comfortable, and Tino be able to compare when he goes to the guest house where everything is actually made of you know wood and thatch and stuff like that ray then says to nika uh i wrote possibly to his daughter that if tino sleeps in the guest house tonight he'll lose faith in her that's exactly what the book says you commented here i think it's for a shot for nikanj ah faith in her Was it yeah her? I- i'd forgotten yeah but hmm <clears throat> Because it, it seemed like it was directed more at Nikanj, because and and Nikanj was the one who was kind of reacting. Yeah, to it, like but the, maybe, the, there maybe was Nikanj's yeah. response, but like um, now I'm confused to be honest. I'm pretty hard, certain mm. that it said her, like he will lose faith in her. That's exactly what the book said. Um, so mm. let's assume for a second that it's a, this is one of his many daughters that he has um, that's mm. you know around uh, Tino. And as he said that mm. Nikanj's body also went smooth, like helplessly smooth, and everybody laughed. The glass smooth flattening of mm. the head and body tinkles normally indicate humor or pleasure, but Akin knew that Nikanj was feeling something else—a hunger that was barely under control. If Nikanj was a human, he would have been trembling. After a moment, it managed to return to normal, but started focusing on Lilith, trying to appeal to her. Basically, Nikanj has hornies, and. Looks Basically, like it. Yep. And the chapter ends with Lilith saying to everyone that it's not nice to make joke out of Tino and they, sh- they should all disperse and go home while smiling. Um, yeah, basically, Kanj is getting horny for Tino and like, and everybody's laughing. But although we all know that all those like many, many daughter constructs that people have, they will try now to uh, seduce him, seduce Tino. That seems to be the case, yeah. Although it also seems like Nikanj wants Lilith. To do it, it's a an I interesting. I think so. Yeah, kind of... I think it's like Nikanj is like, uh huh, Lilith, come on, come on, Lilith, uh uh-huh, uh, uh-huh, come on, come on, um, in his own tentacle way. Um, hmm. So I guess it's gonna be interesting. The next chapter is going to be interesting. With the fact that you know Nikanj is gonna be hovering around, you know, like a uh, <laughs> an uncle in love, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a little weird as well with the I mean the ages are all kind of strange in this because you know they live longer and and so on but the you know N- Nakanj knew Tino as a child man you have to put it that way now it's... it feels really weird <laughs> yeah uh, just you know it's always weird I like <laughs> the, the exercise is pointing out the weird <laughs> uh, I, uh, now it feels wrong and they're really not like the good wrong and the bad wrong, basically. It's just, mm. hmm. I mean, he's an adult now, so I guess. But then conditioning. And con- Lilith, is, Lilith is also way Yeah, older. I mean, yeah, but like uh, Nikanj was conditioning him. That sounds so fucking wrong. 
Mm, let's mm. just leave it there because I don't want to read the book in this in this like in this a light. <laughs> okay, on that weird. Yeah, tone. on that really bad weird <laughs> tone. Like, yeah. Let's uh, talk about your predictions for chapter six. So yeah, I think that in the chapter six is gonna be continuation of that the chapter five. So basically, Tino learning more about like the whole construct village, what the actually all means. Um you know, people trying to chat him up and, you know, and and maybe, you know, we'll learn more about the village, people who live in it, you know, um, Mm -hmm. like, I don't know, maybe some more information about other humans or maybe, I I don't know, like, I I feel like maybe it'll be like, you know, it's a big conversation, then Tino goes to the guest house and then, like, whole night somebody's knocking on his door so every every so often somebody new is knocking on his door trying to be more successful or something less to seducing him or something along those lines okay or maybe just kind of telling everyone uh uh this this boy is mine and then just everybody's like okay yeah i mean they don't seem oh, it's it's weird they sometimes seem possessive but sometimes not they have this you know they do that kind of like bonding thing where they uh you know form the sort of exclusive yeah. connection between the particular Uloi and, and the other humans, but at other points in time, they seem very... Open-minded, open. yeah, on things. It's, no. I guess I, I guess it also depends on, like, the chemistry between other family members, I guess, if they're, like, happy with it, because I guess, you know, that also has to be considered, mm-hmm. like, I mean, I don't think Nikanj would do anything uh, if Lilith is not happy. That's That's the only thing. Um, yes, I mean, pr- probably. Well, yeah, at, at least in the in the relatively narrow context. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the 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 whole broad exercise seems to not be overly um, popular with Lilith, but they're doing it yeah, anyway. Yeah, I guess. <clears throat> but then, well, let's see. Mm. Let's see what the next chapter tell gives us. Um, mm. no, 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 I guess. Yes. Go on. I was just say, yeah. Look, looking forward to to finding out some more uh, of. Uh, how exactly Tino is going to cope with the, <laughs> this rather overwhelming set of circumstances he's uh, now finding himself in. Yeah, it's go- it's going to be interesting like to see how he deals with the whole tentacle from the forehead kids trying to seduce him. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And on that note, everyone, thank you for listening to our podcast. Um, you can find all the places we um, upload uh, our cha- uh, episodes on our website zinotines.com I was Michael Klinka I was Richard Acton bye goodbye